Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Really glad to have you here and want to say thank you to you and also to our friends and colleagues and guests that are joining us online on Zoom. So thank you all for being here with us this evening. Really excited to have you. Um, my name is Greg Hall. I'm the Dean of the Heron School of Art and Design. Again, really pleased to have you here. Um, this is our second um, version. This will be the second time we've had this event. This is the Michael A. and Lori Burns McRobbie Emerging Artists Series. Very excited to bring this forward and looking forward to really wonderful conversation and reception. So we'll hear more about that in a moment. So before I move forward, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge that we're gathered here on the, the traditional ancestral lands of the Miami, Potawatomi, the Shawnee, the Lenape, and other native peoples of the past and present. We also acknowledge that IUPUI displaced the African-American business and residential neighborhoods of Indiana Avenue and Ransom Place in the 1960s. We honor those who have cared for this place in the past, and we hope sincerely that its current use for the pursuit and sharing of knowledge and understanding, which are goals of the university, will lead to a future that is more equitable and just. I heard a question, but it's okay. Okay, so before we begin this evening's talk, I wanna thank our many patrons and friends of Heron. So we're very grateful. I'd also like to share um, that complimentary parking was made possible this evening by the great frame up of Indianapolis and Carmel. If you're parked in the parking garage, you can get a parking validation, um, are they codes or? Yes, so a parking validation code from the gallery team. So if you have any questions about that, ask us and we'll connect you with that, but always grateful for that, making parking not a challenge for people to join us. So um, now I'd like to share a little more about this evening's lecture. The Michael A. McRobbie Emerging Artist Series, and it's actually the Michael A. Robbie McRobbie and Lori Burns McRobbie um, Emerging Artist Series was established in honor of Michael McRobbie, president of Indiana University from 2007 to 2021, and his wife, Lori Burns McRobbie, who also made a wonderful, very impactful, and very positive impact on the university. Um, the annual Michael A. Mc, Michael A. and Lori Burns McRobbie Emerging Artist Series is intended to support national and international emerging artists through an exhibition and their lecture and sometimes residencies here on the IU Indianapolis campus at the Heron School of Art and Design. The program is intended to amplify and broaden the emerging artists' visibility and connections with the field and to provide a platform to realize new innovative ideas and art practices while advancing learning experiences for students, faculty, and friends from our community. I'd like to take a moment also to, um, to thank um, our friend and colleague, um, our gallery manager and an alum from Heron, Elias Garza Garcia, uh, for all the work that that you did on bringing this exhibition together and bringing our guest here this evening. We're really grateful. It was a lot of work and it's a really wonderful exhibition. So thank you so much. And um, at this point, I'm gonna ask Ellis to come join us, but if we could take a moment to thank Ellis, I would be very grateful. So It is my pleasure to introduce Gabrielle today. Gabrielle was born in Zacatecas, Mexico and was raised in Chicago's no Northwest side. He received his BA from the City College of New York where he studied studio art. Garcia Roman is a multidisciplinary artist who examines and decodes the politics of identity through intricate and process-based work. His art has been acquired by the International Center of Photography and has been exhibited in numerous museums and galleries, including the Museum of Latin America, Galeria de la Raza, Cathedral of St. John Divine, the Divine, I'm sorry, and the Center of Photography at Woodstock and Brick. He was a 2018 recipient of the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture Artist Grant and in 2019 was commissioned by the Leslie Lohman Museum to bring his queer icon series into the streets for the 50th anniversary, anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, where 100 queer icon banners were marched down the World Pride route. In 2020, Garcia Roman was one of 10 artists in residence in the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council for Workspace, their flagship residency program. He was one of seven artists to collaborate with Target for their Masque campaign during Latinx Heritage Month. 
Gabriel Garcia Roman Queer Icons is closing tomorrow in the Marsh Gallery, and it's his first major solo exhibition here in the Midwest. Please join me in welcome, welcoming the Michael A. and Lori Burns McRobbie Emerging Artist Series Lecture, Gabriel Garcia Roman. Thank you, Elias, and thanks everybody for being here. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. So I'd like to start off by saying that I'm an introvert and public speaking, see, I'm already, I'm already messing things up, but I get really nervous at first, but it's gonna get a little better as I go along. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so what I wanted to start off the talk with today was uh, a little bit about my story, my origin story before I start the, the uh, slideshow. So I feel like some of these uh, highlights or these points will help you better understand the work that you're about to see. <clears throat> uh, so as Elias mentioned, uh, I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico, and I came to this, my family migrated to the States when I was two years old. So I was too young to remember where I came from, but, and also because of my our undocumented status, we were unable to go back to, to uh, where I was born. <clears throat> I grew up Catholic, so I always consider, and I always say that religious art was my introduction to art. So as a kid growing up, going to church, going to cathedrals, I was always mesmerized by the stained glass windows, by the ornate frames that, you know, these portraits were in, uh, the mosaics in the, the nave. I was always just more fascinated by the art than I was by the doctrine of religion. Uh, I grew up in Chicago in the 70s and 80s where every major city during that time was bankrupt. So I saw struggle everywhere. Um, <clears throat> I also like to say that I was never, I never took art classes or, and I didn't become an artist until I was much later in life, my mid twenties. <clears throat> um, I was always creative as a kid, but I always consider that uh, str struggle makes you creative. You know, you make do with what you have. And also I uh, moved to New York City at the age of 26, where I met somebody who mentored me and who basically uh, took me under his wing and showed me the art world basically, or opened up my eyes to the art world. And then finally, I wanna say that, oh no, <clears throat> also during that time I grew up, the time that I grew up as an immigrant, assimilation was the name of the game. Like everybody was made to assimilate. Everybody was thought that America was a melting pot and we all were supposed to be all in one never different from anybody else. And then finally, I didn't go back to school, or should I say that I started college at 17, dropped out, and didn't go back to school at the age until the age of 33. So I'm 50 years old right now. So just to give you a <clears throat> better understanding. So at 33, I decided to go back to school and get my bachelor's degree. I thought that I had it was working at a dead end job and figured that if I was going to go back to school, I would go back to school for something that I enjoy doing, which was art. Um, all right. So the first slide that the first image you see is some of the first work that I started doing. This these are works that uh, hadn't gone to school yet. I picked up a camera and didn't uh yeah, I, I picked up a camera and started photograph doing self-portraits. <clears throat> so this also coincides with um, moved to New York and growing up in Chicago, where Chicago has a huge Mexican community. I was used to seeing folks that looked like me uh, going to Mexican restaurants, just murals of Mexican art everywhere. Moving to the East Coast in the, in the late 90s, there wasn't a huge Mexican community. So I started uh, looking for it, wasn't finding it. So I somehow was craving it. And the further I was away from home, the more I became militant about my identity or my, my roots. And so I started 
photogra uh, photographing myself and using myself as a subject for a lot of the uh, iconography that I had grown up with and that I was craving uh, living in the East Coast. So the other thing that I want to say is that I mentioned I started with photography, but I always thought, thought photography was a little too flat for me. Uh, and I started interjecting other elements to the photographs. So if you notice, I'm sorry, the first one was started uh, weaving photographs onto my self-portraits. <clears throat> uh, the photographs that are woven around are uh, photographs of murals that I had taken over in while I lived in Chicago and also the first time I went to LA. So another thing, when I moved to New York and it was during the stage where I was talking about where I was craving my culture, I decided to take a trip to LA, which growing up, I always considered LA like the Mecca of Mexican Americans and felt like this is where I need to go to find myself or to like <clears throat> absorb as much as I can about my identity, my culture, go back home and then like uh, spew out whatever comes up. And so this is uh, some of the, some of that work. <clears throat> um, so here's one of the images where I wove the Virgen de Guadalupe around my portrait or into my portrait. And I'm not sure how many of you all are familiar with who the Virgin Mary or, or the Virgen de Guadalupe who's like the patron saint of Mexico. And <clears throat> I'm dressed as Juan Diego, who's the indigenous person who found, uh, who's the Virgen, the Virgen de Guadalupe appeared to. You know, there's a whole story in this, of how the, how this was how the Catholic Church was able to indoctrinate a lot of the indigenous culture was creating a story of an indigenous person uh, <clears throat> finding or being in the desert or a barren land and a bushel of roses appeared. And when he re went back to the bishop to say, I just saw the virgin, they were like, I don't believe you, show us proof. <clears throat> he went back to the site and there was a bushel of roses or a bush of roses where roses normally wouldn't grow. He was he carried those roses onto on his poncho. <clears throat> and when he brought them to the bishop, the image of the virgin was a magic or appeared onto, onto his uh, poncho. So this is me as Juan Diego. Um, <clears throat> images from the Mexican Revolution that I uh, photo transferred on onto myself. So this is also early 2000s. So it's very analog. There's not a lot of this stuff is like just photo transfer using like Citrusol or, you know, before I even knew what Photoshop was. <clears throat> Other images that I started or the same image, uh, the Virgen de Guadalupe is like a recurring image for me because again, it's it's not only at this point, it's not just a Catholic image, it's a Mexican image where it's a, an image that you no longer have to be, it's sort of transferred from it being a Catholic image to a Mexican uh, image or a way that you can tell Anywhere you, you see the Virgen de Guadalupe, you know there's Mexicans in the area. Uh, okay, so that that was the that was the intro or the start of where <clears throat> the start of the of sort of my exploration of art, where photograph and I've always been, as you can see, like I'm. I saw I always start I started weaving and interjecting and, and doing all these things. And so this is a different body of work called Defining You. And this is I started this around the early mid 2000s when I had already went back to school. And so I was already technically a little better. I knew I learned studio lighting and uh just I had a lot more knowledge under my belt. <clears throat> This also coincides during the time when I started therapy. Uh, and 
as many of you know, therapy in therapy, you, you recount and you share a lot about your childhood. And during that process, I started realizing that, you know, it's your childhood experiences, your childhood uh, memories. These are all things that <clears throat> define who you are as an adult, or you bring those into your adulthood. And also, I was highlighting and photographing folks who were similar to me, who are bicultural, or I consider bicultural, where either they're first generation or they were they came here as young, just as young as I was. So they're weaving uh, their mother culture with Amer American culture. <clears throat> you know, we all lived in a very, uh, for example, for me, I lived in a very Mexican household where only Spanish was spoken in, in the house. We mostly only watched uh, Spanish language, listen, listened to Spanish music. But as soon as I stepped out of my house and went to school, it was nothing but English and pop music and, you know, just American. <clears throat> and the other thing that I like to think of these woven, so these are all hand woven and all the images that you see, oh, I forgot to mention the big part, which is all the photographs you see around them are their childhood photographs. Uh, so maybe I should go back just so you could be able to yeah, so I what I did is I photo took a photograph of them with the plain color background, and then I made a collage of all of their photographs that they had given me, and made it one big print, and then I started weaving those around the portrait. <clears throat> and as you can see, I my work is very labor intensive, and as I have a lot of anxiety, just as of double Virgo and just being me, like I'm just, I'm just always anxious. And my art practice has allowed me to learn to be a lot more uh, meditative. Like all of these things are not only my voice, but it's also allows me to be a lot more uh, centered uh, because every slice that I make, I'm meditating, I'm slowing down my breathing, my brain, starts to slow down a little bit in it <clears throat> and it just helps me be a better human. Uh, so this is one of the last ones that I that I worked in the series and if you notice I started weaving onto the portrait of the person not where before I was being very meticulous about keeping the image separate from the uh, <clears throat> the image from the wheat from the collage and this way I started thinking about, how there you'll be walking around somewhere and randomly like a a memory from the past just happens to hit you out of nowhere. It could be because you smelled something or you saw something or heard something that just made a memory come back. So that's <clears throat> that's why I started thinking of not being so much so careful about keeping it separate, but blending it in together. And there, also, there's something really great about, again, I mentioned, I don't know how many of y'all are into astrology, but Virgos are very, we're very uh, meticulous. We like control. And <clears throat> what I loved about working on the series is that I never knew what image or what the pattern was going to look like until I was over. I just knew I had a pattern. And then all of the images from the back coming in and coming out were <clears throat> more of like a surprise. And it wasn't until the end where I was, I got to see what the final product was. So that idea of like the unknown was something that I was look, would look forward to. And each one of these takes me about like 20 hours total to from beginning to end of weaving up the images. <clears throat> Okay, so now I want to talk about the ongoing series that I've been working on for a while now called Queer Icons. Um, <clears throat> queer Icons is a portrait series that highlights uh, queer folks of color, queer and trans folks of color. And uh, the reason I started this work is I was sort of at the tail end of, of 
school already. It was my last year of school and I had learned all of these techniques. I was working, uh, doing printmaking. And at the same time, I had already spent four years of going to galleries for, you know, the classes that I was taking, going to museums and taking all these art history courses. But in all of these four years that I did that, I never saw myself or my community represented in any of these spaces. <clears throat> so I felt that I wanted to create a, a body of work that inserted our narrative into, into the art canon. <clears throat> and so if you notice, I borrowed a lot of imagery or a lot of uh, textures from Northern Renaissance. Like uh, I was a big fan of Nor Northern Renaissance art and Flemish art, like. Jan van Eyck and uh, I'm forgetting the other one that I always look to, but uh, <clears throat> I was very, I was in love with all of the textures and all of the symbolism behind every single thing in the, in these paintings, the, the flowers and, and it, they were also, all of these portraits were always centered around people with money. Right, they were always like the elite, the uh, the nobles, and so what I wanted to do is I wanted to insert basically what society considers right. It's like folks of color and queer folks together, two identities that are like don't want to say the bottom of the, of the totem pole, but we're, you know we're it's a disen disenfranchised community that never gets to see themselves in this light. So I wanted to create something for, for our community. <clears throat> Another thing that was happening during this time was mar marriage equality. It was around 2011, 2012 when I started this. And it was around, yeah, the same time when marriage equality was a big push. And queer culture was also starting to become mainstream where you started to see queer folks on uh, television shows as well as like uh, actors, movie stars coming out, coming out of the closet. And, <clears throat> and again, still not seeing my community being part of that. So that was another reason why I wanted to create that. So what I started doing and what I always do when I create uh, a series is I always start with myself and then my friends. I include my friends because you know they're the easiest subjects. You don't have to you don't have to pay them. <laughs> you use your friends and then you start asking you know, your friends of friends. And at this point, I had already started working on this series for a couple of years when I started uh put uploading them on Tumblr, Instagram, and showing them in some small spaces, um, in some small spaces. But, sorry, let me get some water. And <clears throat> yeah, it started, and at this point it started getting a little too big for me where I was sort of losing sight of what what story I was trying to say, like, okay, so I'm photographing the queer folks of color and putting them in this light. <clears throat> but it, I felt like at that time I, I needed something to, to bring it back to its origin. And then that's when I met Mitchell. Uh, and this is Mitchell who at this point, I had never met this person. You know, I, he was a friend of friend, a friend of a friend who was recommended to be part of the series. And they came over. I had already, and okay. So another thing is, all of the work that I that you see, I take in my living room. Like, <clears throat> I have a huge ceiling, and I'm able to create a photo studio in my living room. Again, going back to how I grew up, make do with what you have, right? I don't, at the time I couldn't afford a studio, I couldn't afford, but I could move away my couch, put a seamless, put on some lights and there's a studio. <clears throat> so he came over, saw the studio lights and was overwhelmed and was like, I can't do this. I can't, I'm not, 
I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for this. <clears throat> I was like, is there anything I can do to like calm you down? Or he's like, yeah, look, why don't we go get a drink, hang out uh, in your backyard and just get to know each other. And so in that process, he shared his story of how he had moved to New York. He was born and raised in Texas. He was, uh, and moved to New York at the age of 15. He had run away from home because he was <clears throat> living in a very like a uh, ultra religious conservative household. <clears throat> and he was queer and moved, ran away and moved to New York. And as a 15 year old with not much education <clears throat> and a need to survive, he turned to sex work as his ways uh, of, you know, to survive. And he shared his story about <clears throat> one of his friends who was the same age as him, who had been murdered by his John. And because his friend was a young bl uh, black queer person, nothing was being done. It was in the media wasn't being involved. And as a 15 year old, he took it upon himself to, <clears throat> to go to, to disrupt any press release or public. When there was a politician, he would just, go and like chant his friend's name. <clears throat> and I still get teared up even talking about it because imagine like as a 15 year old to to have the strength and will to <clears throat> go beyond yourself and work for or bring justice to your friend. <clears throat> so he really completely shifted my project or this project into thinking or where I wanted to only highlight activists and community organizers, artists, folks who are doing work for the community, right? They're, they are they are going above and beyond um, themselves for the betterment of their community. And in my eyes, they are our modern day saints. <clears throat> and for me, I, the halo had always been even as a kid, I was always mesmerized by the halo. I always hearing stories of the origins of you know of the saints. I always thought that the halo was the badge of honor. It was like a you do something, you know, you're a human. You do something, and then you get after the miracle that you that you create or that you do, you get a halo. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's very like a very simple way of explaining it, but that's. That's where the ID comes from. So another thing that I had decided or that I had realized at the time was that, again, this is this is a project that at this point, it's like 12 years old. So I'm talking like within years, things start shifting within the project itself. <clears throat> so I had already uh, exhibited this work in some spaces. And every time I would show these spaces, showing these spaces, people always asked, well, who are these people, right? And then I started thinking, me, myself, I'm doing the exact same thing that society is doing. Like, I'm, so, I'm silencing these, these folks. I'm not sharing their story. I'm just sharing <clears throat> their image. And in a way, I, I thought like, wow, I'm exploiting them the same way that society exploits them. <clears throat> so then I started to think and thought that what better way to amplify their voice or their themselves, but to include their texts or their writings, their ideas, their story around their portrait. And so that's what you see around their portrait is <clears throat> it's their their uh, their story that they wrote, they literally hand wrote around their portrait. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, also a printmaking process. I'm not sure how many of you all are familiar with photogravure, but it's a it's a photogravure is a it's an etching etching process where it's a metal plate. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the exhibit where there's a video on loop that shows the entire process on a time lapse. <clears throat> but because it's a printmaking uh, process, I have a metal plate that has the image itself. And because it's a metal plate, I can ink the plate 
and <clears throat> play with the colors. So the other thing that I neglected to say, which is very important, I guess, and you in it, if you haven't seen the exhibit, you you'll have a better understanding is that these are uh, prints and there's nothing digital about this work. This is all hand cut uh, paper that's been collaged onto the print. <clears throat> so, and that's why I'm showing this example is that with every image that you see, there's at least three or four other versions of the same of the same print. So the, all the color you see is actually decorative paper uh, that I've collected over the years and and used that for the project. So, for example, the halo is one piece of paper. The purple background is another. The top, the copper top in the middle is another, and then the dress, the skirt is another one. <clears throat> and then I then after I'm done with the print, I screen print their text around their portrait. So they're not necessarily they're not actually writing onto the print. But what I do is I once I decided what image they, they get, that I, well, what image I'm going to use for the prints, I send them a Xerox copy, which is just a black and white photograph. And then they while I'm making the print, they're spending the two or three weeks writing their text where then I scan it <clears throat> and then size it to whatever the size of the print that I'm going to make. And uh, the other thing is that these prints take about three to four weeks to finish because because it's a printmaking process and because it's a wet process where the white paper gets uh, gets submerged in water and it's the wheat paste and everything else that when I run it through the printing press, fuses all of those layers together. And once I pull it out of the press, I have to keep it flat under some blotter paper or keep it flat so that it dries flat because if it doesn't dry flat, it starts to warp. Um, <clears throat> so I guess what I'm saying is that I pull it out of the print and I, it's gonna be another three to four weeks before I actually see what the, what the actual print ended up looking like. And again, over over the years, uh, I started including other aspects of other parts of work that I started doing. So during this time, I'm also at the same time I'm, I'm uh, going into a rabbit hole on embroidery. So I started embroidering for something else, but then I started including the sequence onto those uh, onto the print. <clears throat> And another thing that I wanted to mention was not only I wanted these to be visual affirmations, right, for the queer community, but I also wanted them to be, <clears throat> I wanted, every time that I photograph them, I always, for me, the posture and the way they, they are holding themselves is very important, right? I, I always wanted them to be like chest out, looking defiantly at the camera because <clears throat> I want them to look to look out at the viewer to saying like, you know, no matter all of the struggle that have that has happened, I'm still here and I'm defiantly here. Like our existence is our resistance. <clears throat> and so th the other thing that I want to mention or that I want to talk about is are the frames, which is, yeah, the frames. So in 2017, I had my first solo exhibit and I had uh, foolishly thought that I was going to be able to afford to frame uh, my work professionally and came to come to find out that it costs like over $200 for one frame. <laughs> Imagine doing that with 40 prints. So I'm like, struggle, I'm poor, uh, but I have enough money to buy a table saw and I'm gonna look up YouTube to see how do you make a frame? And that's exactly what I started doing was like, <clears throat> I just started devouring YouTube videos on how to make frames. And at that point I had like a year, you know, I had a year to to create these frames. So I'm like, okay, 
I can do this. I got this. So I started making my own frames. And even with, within the frames, uh, there was, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> So the frames were became like an integral part of the of the of the series or the prints at that at this point, where <clears throat> what I started doing is I wanted to not only have like the a simple frame, but I wanted to mimic the Rococo frames that you would see the saints in in the cathedral. They're usually like flowery, flowy, and and uh, very ornate with a lot of gold, a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of gold and a lot of rich dark woods. <clears throat> but uh, what it, but instead what I wanted to do is I wanted, I like clean lines and I like uh, not necessarily minimalism, but I really like just sharp lines. So I decided that instead of like curves and flowery movement, I wanted like blocks. <clears throat> so, at the same time, I had all with this table saw, I had a year, I had started making the frames and I'm like, you know what? I also wanted a bench for my backyard. So I'm going to start making a bench. And so then I started doing that. So I started working on other projects. During that time, I made a coffee table. I made like a TV stand. And so at that point, I had all of this amazing wood, right? I had some walnut, I had some mahogany, some pine, whatever, like, I just had all this wood in in my basement. <clears throat> and I said, well, these are all like really weird shape. Like I can't do anything with these scraps. So what does somebody do that struggles? We make beauty out of out of scraps, right? So that's when I <clears throat> that's when I started adding the blocks around the around the frames. <clears throat> and not only and at that point. It be, they became not only, or I want these prints then became uh, objects of devotion, right? Because they were they became relics because they were encased in this in this little treasure treasure box. <clears throat> and then, not only that, I saw, also started thinking about the idea of like how community works, where I could have simply made a frame with four four pieces of wood. But then very similar to community, right? Where one, <clears throat> if you add one one block, glue it onto another one, glue another block onto that one, and then another one onto that one, it reinforces that, <clears throat> that frame. And then that frame becomes a lot stronger than having simple four pieces of wood. So it's again, it's like another <clears throat> idea of like community where Community, bringing community together makes us all stronger. <clears throat> uh, there, I did include one of my embroidered hearts into, into this print. Um, there's another one. <clears throat> and again, so another thing is that these are all, I don't have a say so of what they write or what it is or how they're gonna lay it out, it's just, because again, I'm a control freak. And if I actually said, okay, no, this is, can you do it this way? Do it that way? I'm like, I don't, I don't read what they write until I'm done with the print. Because if I find a typo or a misspelling, I'm going to say, hey, you got to do all of this all over again because I found this typo. Instead, I'm like, <clears throat> I want to be blind to, to what they write until it's done. <clears throat> And the other thing with this work is, is that pri actually prior to another thing that I wanted to mention or, or is that before my first solo show, and the, actually the reason I got that solo show is that I mentioned that I had started in, uh, uploading my, all of this work on my Tumblr page, on my Instagram page, and the work just started getting reshared and it just started to have a life of its own <clears throat> that, and, you know, I would put hashtags at the time when hash, hashtags had just come out. So I'm like, gay, queer, uh, all these things. 
<clears throat> and there was a curator that literally <laughs> found me through a hashtag and included me. He reached out to me and said, wow, this work is amazing. I want to include it in my show in LA, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay, sure. <clears throat> Ship my work out there. And then like two weeks later, I get a call from the organizer of the exhibit who's saying there's a <clears throat> there's a journalist in LA that wants to interview you for a story. And I'm like, uh -huh. the introvert in me was like, no, I don't want that. Can it be email? Can I just respond by email? And they're like, no, it has to be over the phone, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so I did it, you know, we, I probably didn't do a good job because it was the first time where I'm like talking about my work. And, <clears throat> but anyway, that, that journalist <clears throat> worked for NBC and then it became, I, guess, I don't know how that works, but <clears throat> he wrote an article about my work and then other organizations, other arts organizations and media outlets started resharing that article. <clears throat> and then my work just started getting shared everywhere. And that was all just because of social media, you know, where it's like everybody gets gives Instagram and Facebook and all these things like <clears throat> they it gets a, a bad rap. But let me tell you that I've constantly apply to residencies, uh, shows, things like that, I get rejected on everything. <clears throat> what Everything that I've gotten has been through my social media, literally. I'm like, I just recently got a very huge grant. And how did they find my work? Through my Instagram, because they've been following my work for a few years. <clears throat> and they had just gotten into this position they had gotten into this position in this arts funding organization and they were like i know exactly who i want to nominate for this <clears throat> and when they reached out to me and they were like hey you want some money i'm like i re ignored that e i ignored that dm and i was like uh, this is a scam and i <clears throat> ignored it two weeks later they emailed me again or dm me again and i was like no i don't think th I, this can't be real they somehow found my email, emailed me, and they were like, hey, I've reached out several times, but I'm going to email you. And they're like, "If why don't we get on a Zoom? Maybe it'll make more sense. And I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> anyway, sometimes those things are real. <laughs> sometimes those things are real. And yeah, not only real, but surreal, because it's pretty crazy. <clears throat> Um, also, I, I think I included this image also because I wanted to include, or I started including a lot more, not only just individuals, but I wanted to create <clears throat> um, visuals of queer families, right? Uh, and so I met this this uh, couple that lived out in Northern California, and <clears throat> I happened to be there for for a couple of weeks and I was grateful that they they wanted to include uh that they wanted to be part of the project <clears throat> and these last couple that I'm going to show you are just from this series are just uh this is not the same process the, because of COVID so another thing right struggle uh make do with what you have all of the work that you've seen I volunteer at a print shop at the school that I went to and that's I sneak in and make all of this work while I'm supposed to be helping students uh, uh, with their work so you know I'm working on on my little corner while everybody's everybody else is working on theirs but in in 2018 2019 I was reached out by a gallery who wanted to <clears throat> basically commissioned me to go to, to Syracuse and photograph queer folks from their community uh, and at least include 10 people, come back home, make prints, <clears throat> go back a, several months later and have a solo show <clears throat> around these 10, 10 images. And at the time, because of COVID, 
uh, the print shop, well, the school was closed. So I'm like, how am I going to create this work? <laughs> Again, struggle, uh, making do with what you have. I'm like, <clears throat> I could figure out some other way to, to make it look like my other work, but it's still going to be part of the same thing. So these are actually like, uh, <clears throat> they're digital prints, but then I collage on top of the digital prints. So I still sort of use the same techniques of collaging where I added, <clears throat> um, printed, or yeah, I, I started experimenting with different techniques that I, so it could look like iridescent, similar to how my original work looks like. <clears throat> and the last thing I want to mention during the, or of from the series is that in 2019, I was commissioned by Leslie Lohman, which is a queer museum. And uh, they call themselves the first queer museum in the world. I don't know, I haven't fact checked that, but I, I love to use that as my, hey, the first queer museum commissioned me to have 20 of my, or fit, 100 of my banners paraded on World Pride, which was the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. Um, now, mind you, like this is a immigrant queer kid who didn't ever think he had a voice, who was always doubtful of himself, <clears throat> who, um, yeah, just doubtful, ha had a very low self-esteem growing up <clears throat> to be invited and to be included to march their artwork as the first artist to be commissioned by this museum to be part of a of a uh, pride march <clears throat> parading down fifth avenue where you're passing times square uh <clears throat> empire state building like all of these icon icon the all these icon I iconic buildings spaces was really surreal to me so um there's a video out there floating with the where you could see this actually moving. So, yeah. So that's <clears throat> that's how I want to end with for queer icons. But there's still a little more before. Just hopefully you're not not bored. <laughs> uh, so, oh, I guess I included some images from uh, that I was in this year. I was included, or I was commissioned by the Cathedral of Saint John the Divine, which is the largest cathedral in the world, right? It's the largest cathedral in the world. Commit uh, asked me to include 12 of my frame prints uh, for their pride uh, <clears throat> event. And so another just surreal experience to see my work in a religious space, right? Like here are queer folks of color in a religious space. Like what? <clears throat> this is the most recent, this is the latest print and it's it's part of the exhibit. <clears throat> okay, so the last the last series or the last couple of slides that I'm gonna talk about uh, are just, <clears throat> yeah, are, this is a, also part of the exhibit. But so this is a, another woven photograph that I did uh, of myself and my dad. <clears throat> so I grew up with a dad who, a very traditional father who thought that to raise your kids, you only had two ways of doing it is either through love or through fear. And since my father didn't know love, he only knew fear. <clears throat> we only, he, that's how we were raised. We were raised with fear. So I never had a re an actual relationship with him. It was more of him telling us what we needed to do and and what we needed. Yeah, we just, we were always told what to do and never, we never had a conversation. <clears throat> so I held on to that anger and I held on to that hurt into my adulthood. <clears throat> now my father passed away 10 years ago and it's during that time when even when my father passed away, I was still really hurt and I was still very angry. 
that <clears throat> when my sister called me to tell me, I didn't cry and I didn't, I had no emotion. I was like, okay. <clears throat> the next day I felt really guilty about that. And I started, I wanted to process or I wanted to like have tears come out of my eyes or make something happen. Have, so what I did, is I started looking through all of the photographs that I had of my father. <clears throat> and I saw I saw this photograph that happened to look like he was exactly, he was positioned in the same way that I was positioned in a photograph that, it, that I liked of myself. <clears throat> and it just hit me. I'm like, oh, I could weave my father and me together. And maybe that's, I don't know, it's going to create some kind of cathartic feeling where I'm going to finally cry and finally process. And it did help. And I didn't cry. But <clears throat> what I did, what it did make me do, it took uh, several years for it to get there. But <clears throat> I started thinking that, or what I wanted to do is that instead of holding on to that anger, because my father's gone, and I can't, process it with him anymore right because <clears throat> where is that anger going to go it's not going to go anywhere if you don't let it out process it so even a, a few uh, two or three years after his death I was still like harboring that anger <clears throat> and I started to shift my narrative of him and instead of seeing him as as an abuser or as a <clears throat> as a tyrant as, as all these things i started seeing him as other in other ways as well because my father was also a brilliant person right he was <clears throat> he was had very little education but somehow he knew about stocks and bonds and he was always looking through the those little numbers in the newspaper where i still don't understand what that what that is but somehow somebody that only had like a sixth grade education was always like he knew what what those things meant and he would he knew about that anyway not only that but there was also other things where my father was have always had always been a, cre a creative person who what he did is he liked to uh <clears throat> pull things apart and put them back together so he could see how things worked and i was always his unwilling assistant where you know, I he'd be like, here, come sit next to me, and he would pull something apart, and he, I would just be there, have to be there by his side, and of course, I was like looking to see also. <clears throat> anyway, I guess what I'm saying is that if it wasn't for his curiosity, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. Where, <clears throat> thanks to him, I had the, the thought like I wasn't scared of table saws, I wasn't scared of. Uh, power tools because I had grown up with them and I was always, a, again, his assistant. And then I started thinking like, I'm an artist because of him. And so <clears throat> I need to pay pay homage to the person that made me who I am today. <clears throat> and so that's why I included that. And that's what <clears throat> the next couple of slides are things that I've been exploring in the last couple of years. <clears throat> so I started uh, exploring sculpture what i i wanted to think about is like my father was always a laborer he always worked in factories always worked in manufacturing you know in chicago 70s and 80s midwest factories everywhere that was everybody worked in the factory well everybody all, all my family worked in the factory <clears throat> worked in a factory or in in the service industry and so I started exploring this concept of like American labor is immigrant labor. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to create uh, <clears throat> this idea of like the of leisure with uh, labor. So in Mexico, there's these traditional uh, holidays where people, some people dress as like a jaguar uh, for parades. And the ja jaguar has a, a is a representation of like fierceness and uh, ferocity. <clears throat> but I what I wanted to do is I wanted to recreate those head those headpieces that they that are worn during those festivals, 
but using um, materials from two of the biggest industries that employ immigrant labor, which are manufacturing and construction. <clears throat> so it, this is a construction hat and I added all the rivets basically like from jeans onto, onto the, uh, to the construction. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if, if it's the same, same thing here, but in New York, if there's construction, scaffolding, there's always green scaffolding that covers the, uh, the storefront or whatever that's getting worked on. So that's where the, the base comes from. <clears throat> Another thing is uh, I'm from Zacatecas uh, where cactus is everywhere, but specifically the, the Nopal cactus. And I, I use the Nopal cactus a lot as a, uh, as a symbol for immigrants, for the immigrant community, because immigrants, the immigrant community is, very, is highly adaptable similar to cactus, as well as like needs very little water to survive. <clears throat> My father always wore a cap and like very man, many laborers, you know, you wear a cap for, to shade yourself. And my father always had a cap. And so I wanted to create <clears throat> these sculptures. These are uh, concrete. Also the idea of like concrete manufacturing, um, and here's another, this is a ceramic sculpture that I made of a crown, <clears throat> but with using the motif of a, of a cactus and the prickly pears are the, uh, the, the glass beads that you see on there. <clears throat> and now this one is, is more related to myself as a first generation, right? Where, um, being first generation, like your parents put so much weight on your success. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> they, they put so much pressure on you to be like a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be all these things uh, because they're saying, you know, I risk my life for your, <laughs> for you. And so <clears throat> it's like the, that idea of like heavy is the, is the head that wears a crown, right? Where it's like, all of this pressure is is a lot. <clears throat> Here's another iteration of the, this is also a ceramic. And this one has the little needles that I've inserted in there. I believe this is the, the last slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's the, uh, the end of my talk. And I'm really, I love Q and A, so hopefully people have questions. <laughs> All right, we have some time for a few questions. Raise your hand and we'll take a mic to you. Okay, so um, you mentioned that you were growing up in the 70s and 80s and a big and queer people are a bit like prominent aspect of your work. Mm -hmm. And a big event for queer people in the 80s was the AIDS crisis. Right. And I was wondering if that viewing that growing up impacted your view of queer people in art and media, mm -hmm. and if that had any um, influence on your queer icons' works. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Like, uh, you know, I was still very young during the time of the AIDS crisis. I was, uh, I was like 10, 12 years old when, at the height of that. Uh, I mean, we're still in a crisis, but <clears throat> during the when it was all over the news, and as a young queer person, AIDS. It didn't, it didn't make it into my work or again, because at that time I wasn't thinking that I was an artist or even making art, but it, it did affect me as just a queer person in general, where I was at that time, I was too scared to even admit to myself that I was gay because it meant, at least according to media, if you are gay, you're going to die. And <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't want to be gay and I didn't, uh, didn't want to die. So it wasn't until like, I think I, well, I came out when I was 19. So I was already, it was already past that. <clears throat> but yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think that has in, influenced uh, 
queer icons at least. But that I never thought about that, and I need I should I need to think about that because maybe it did, and I haven't thought about it. <clears throat> but I appreciate that question. I was wondering about uh, your woven images. I know that you had mentioned that the backgrounds were in color. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if the backdrops you used were already in color before you wove them or if you put a background into them afterwards. No, they're, they're all... Uh, they're all a solid background. So it's just a, like, for example, I posed her in front of a... a pink seamless <clears throat> so if the raw image would just be her with the pink background <clears throat> and then i so i yeah then i sliced it you could see the on this one I, I left the slices at the bottom so you could see that it's sliced uh vertically <laughs> sliced vertically and then i wove the the childhood uh, photographs horizontally Could you talk a little bit about your process of learning these different weaving patterns and implementing those and how you choose to build that weaving pattern? Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually I started, uh, so one thing that I'd neglect to mention is that I have a, I have a day job that I've had for a while and I have a lot of downtime. And during that downtime, you know, I mentioned YouTube videos. I do that while I'm working. And I started researching woven, like weaving patterns or weave patterns. <clears throat> and so I started collecting as many as I could simply so that I could uh, include them in my work. But at that time I wasn't very like considering like, okay, this weave means this because, so then I'm gonna add it to that, to this specific print. It was more like aesthetics <clears throat> at that time. Um, how do you feel about um, the importance of being Mexicanidad y Nopalidad in your artwork? Like, how important is that for you? What was the first one? Like, how important is to, like, create Nopalidad, like Nopales, and the Mexicanidad, how important is that in your mm -hmm. work? You said Caridad? No, nopalidad, like Nopal. Right. Yeah, in Mexicanidad. Oh, in Mexicanidad. Yeah, like, how, how important is that in you, in your work, and, and do you feel like the Mexican artist is more acceptable now than it used to be back like in the nineties or eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I definitely think I've definitely feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a huge advocate in social media, so I'm constantly going to bring it up and say that social media has definitely made the art world or art a lot more democratic and <clears throat> it allows for more people to show their work and allows for more folks who normally wouldn't be included in in these art spaces to be more accessible and i think the museums and galleries are definitely doing a lot better about including artists that are either mexican or you know of other identities <clears throat> so i definitely i'm appreciative of that and i'm i'm very uh happy to be part of that uh part of that for sure Um, how did you really start on social media? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I saw the, I saw them and then I saw another, who, what was the question? Okay. Uh, how did you start on social media? And also, um, are there any other artists that inspire, inspire you or people that have inspired your work? Um, yeah. How did I start it? Well, I, at the time I, Tumblr, I don't know if Tumblr is still around, but I, I was using Tumblr a lot. Um, <laughs> I was using Tumblr a lot and, uh, yeah, I, I literally just would post them, hashtag them, and then people would just reshare it. <clears throat> now with my social media, I mostly use Instagram. And I use Instagram 
I, I like to think differently than what a lot of people do, which is <clears throat> I'll share, I'll curate what's going to be on my on my feed. But on my story is you get like personal stories of who I am <clears throat> that help other people understand where my work comes from and what <clears throat> journeys I've gone through life to get me to where I'm at. So I like to be very, because I am not a vulnerable person in real time, I get to become vulnerable in social media where <clears throat> I'll talk about my childhood and then post it and won't look at it until I start seeing responses or whatever. And it's, <clears throat> uh, and I realized that being vulnerable, that people are attracted to people when they're vulnerable or they're when they share their story because <clears throat> nobody wants to be alone. Nobody wants to feel like they're the only ones that are going through this. And when you see somebody that's going through or that has gone through something that you're going through, it makes you gravitate towards their work or it makes you gravitate towards, <clears throat> towards their work. So I always say like, as uncomfortable as it could be, be as vulnerable as you can uh, in these spaces because there's somebody's out there, you know, waiting to hear from you. Well, I just want to say thank you, Gabriel, for coming and speaking and telling us your stories uh, <laughs> and talking about your work. Um, I, I knew you said earlier on about that you always found photography a bit flat. Mm -hmm. And I can really appreciate that. And I like seeing how you come to your your own ways of um, using that constraint and overcoming it. Yeah. But I'm curious how, as someone that came to art later, or as you kind of matured um, as a as a person, why was photography at the forefront to begin with? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> because I did not know how to paint, did not know how to draw, <laughs> and, What's the other the other thing to do? Use a uh, use a camera, <laughs> and then I think that's when I started exploring screen printing and other things that still were photo based in that in that same sense. <clears throat> and then that's sort of like etched me or like moved me onto other things like ceramics and sculpture. <clears throat> but I still don't know how to draw, and I still don't know how to paint. <laughs> There's time, yeah. We got time for a couple more questions. So you mentioned um, a sort of catharsis that happens when you're producing your work. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten responses from your sitters or your subjects about the experience? Like some of them, of course, are writing their stories and that must be pretty moving. Um, but especially for these early works, did you get responses from any of the people who were your subjects? Um, no, I, yeah, I don't think I didn't, I don't, not that I'm thinking about it. I'm like, no, I don't think I got anything outside of well, like, wow, that's a, like, that's, you did that for me, <laughs> but the, no, I didn't, I don't think thinking about it. No, I, I, it, when you like me hearing that question makes me think like, wait, I don't, I rarely ever hear about people who's I photographed tell me what they think about my work. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I've gotten any responses from, from folks. One more. I feel like weaving and culture goes kind of hand in hand. Oh, I'm sorry, I could I could hardly hear you. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yes. No. Um, I feel like weaving and culture go hand in hand. Like many cultures experience, like people hand weaving. Um, when you got into weaving, was there was it any like culturally like inclination to do so? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Like uh, 
<clears throat> during this the time of this work, I was also I had mentioned that I was unable to go back to Mexico because I, we were undocumented. <clears throat> Just real like a quick thing is like moved out of my parents' home when I was seventeen. I was too busy surviving or trying to survive that I didn't. Uh, I couldn't afford to go back to Mexico, even though at that point I was able to go back to Mexico. But because again, because <clears throat> as a 17 year old on their own, the idea of like traveling back to Mexico or buying an airplane was uh, impossible. Didn't go back to Mexico until I was in my thirties when my parents retired and moved back to Mexico. Then I started visiting every year and every year I would, or I would discover things about or visual things that somehow were in me, if that makes some kind of sense. It was like ancestral knowledge that somehow <clears throat> I would I would go to the small town where I was born and I'm like, yo, the, these two colors, this color combination I just used on my own work like two weeks ago. So I think there was, there's always been like the, the <clears throat> traditional like weavings that are in Mexico, Southern Mexico, and specifically in Zacatecas, there's like the, um, I'm forgetting the name, but it's like the, the weavings that are used for, <clears throat> for belts and, and uh, other, other things have made it or have influenced this work for sure. Thank you all for being here tonight. I wanna to remind you that this is also a closing reception. So if you'll join us in the gallery, um, the galleries are open throughout the building. Um, there is also some refreshments down by the Marsh Gallery. So if you haven't seen, had a chance to see the exhibitions and to see Gabriel's work, um, or if you'd like to see it again, please join us and please join me in thanking Gabriel. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I do I do wanna say one one last thing is that I know there are introverts out there and who are too shy to ask questions with a microphone, but so I'll be at the reception if you want to like have a one-on-one. -on -one.